pleasure to see Dr. Pindrick. And I'm going to let Dr. Juan Pablo Navarro do some introductions. And then at the end, I'll say a few words about Jonathan. So JP, you want to take it away? Absolutely, was. Uh, first, also, I'd like to acknowledge the great attendance that we have from international uh, participants. So this morning, we have uh, close to 20 attendees in person and 40 virtual participants from 11 different countries, including Bolivia, Colombia, Greece, France, Mexico, Italy, Japan, India, Thailand, Peru, and multiple states in the U.S. And it's, of course, an honor for me to introduce Dr. Jonathan Pindrick, who is an assistant professor in nursery at Ohio University. Can, and can, I, can I make a correction? He's an associate professor. I just saw his signature, so we want to we want to be accurate. I saw his signature. This must have happened over the last few months or something. So congratulations, Jonathan. So keep going, JP. Thank you. <laughs> and he's also director of the epilepsy surgery program at National Wide Children's Hospital, and he will be talking about shunt related CSF over drainage during treatment of infant hydrocephalus when supraphysiologic becomes super bad. And as you can see here, Dr. Pinder graduated summa cum laude from University of Maryland for his Bachelor of Science in 2003, making his way into Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where he graduated in 2007, and where he also trained as neurosurgeon, being the chief resident from 2013 to 2014, and completed also a fellowship on pediatric neurosurgery at UAB in 2015. Uh, Dr. Pindrick has been awarded with multiple honors and awards, among which we can highlight the College of Computer, Mathematical, and Physical Sciences Outstanding Undergraduate Award from the University of Maryland and the Johns Hopkins Department of Neurosurgery Chairman's Award for Improving Patient Safety. Uh, his contribution to literature has been relevant on the neurosurgical field with uh, 605 citations and an H index of 13 on Scopus. It's a complete honor to introduce Dr. Pindrick this morning. Um, we made a plaque for you, sir, uh, that we will be sending your way uh, after this lecture is over. And thank you so much for being here. Wow. Thank you. Uh, thank I cannot you. thank you guys enough. Uh, I've just been incredibly yeah. impressed with with the program that, that you've built and building, Dr. Canones. And uh, I can't say how thankful I am, you know, for this opportunity. So well, I want to say something personal because I, I this is a plaque that they the fellows and the residents and and also Karen and, and everybody who invited you, they put together, they do a lot of the work, but I was thinking about it as your introduction was happening. I came up, you know, with several words that best describe describe you as in my years of interacting with you when I was a, a junior faculty and I saw you going through the residency. Availability, affability, ability, and accountability. Once again, availability, affability, ability, and accountability. Those are the words that best describe you in my mind. And just to think about the many nights you were on call, both at Bayview, at Johns Hopkins and pediatrics, and the way that you took care of patients was truly amazing. As I look back, you know, and I have to admit it, at the time I took it for granted because you were surrounded by a tremendous amount of talent. But now that I look back, it wasn't easy to excel and to stand out in among a group of amazing residents that were your core residents and you stood up and you did a beautiful job and everybody knew your dedication and your passion for the care of patients and your attention to detail that was meticulous in nature. So congratulations, Dr. Pindrick. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna let you share okay. your, um, your uh, presentation and we're so blessed to have you here and thank you for being here with us. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I, I can't say thank you enough for those kind words. So um, do you see the screen okay? And I'm going to put it in presenter mode. We see it perfectly. And we may okay. have it in a little bit. The presenter mode may be a little bit off. You may need to go in the display settings. Because okay. we're seeing your next slide right now. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, now it's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, again, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, I really appreciate all of the mentoring and instruction you gave me when I was going through the program. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about that at the end, but, uh, but thank you. Um, and I thank you very much to everyone uh, for inviting me you know, for this opportunity. Um, when I was originally uh, scheduled to give this lecture before I had to you know, unfortunately postpone, uh, I was gonna talk about pediatric epilepsy surgery, which is a, a topic which I'm really passionate about. Um, 
But over the past six or eight months, um, there's been another topic in pediatric neurosurgery, which I've, I've learned a lot about and become equally passionate about. Uh, and this is really the first time I'm presenting on it. So um, I'm really excited and, and, you know, I'm curious to hear everyone's, you know, everyone's, everyone's feedback. But uh, today I'm going to be talking about shunt-related cerebral spinal fluid overdrainage during the treatment of infant hydrocephalus. And the kind of the subtitle is when superphysiologic becomes super bad. Um, there are no relevant disclosures. My only irrelevant disclosure is that I'm actually from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, you know, where Dr. Quinone and I met and, uh, you know, I, was, I trained under him and I'm a, I'm a diehard, fierce Ravens fan, uh, Maryland fan and Orioles fan. So got the thumbs up from Dr. Quinone. So it's good. I'm on, among, among friends here. <laughs> Um, this is just a brief, uh, brief outline. You know, there's, we'll be giving a little bit of a background overview and specifically talking about um, some of the epidemiology of hydrocephalus. Then we'll go into shunt-related CSF overdrainage and one of the primary topics I'm interested in, which is post-shunting acquired craniosynostosis. And then we'll talk about some of the next steps. So just as a background, um, the epidemiology of pediatric hydrocephalus, this gives you an idea of how large uh, the scope of, of, of the problem of hydrocephalus is. The incidence is about 400,000 cases per year worldwide, and about 200,000 of those cases per year are actually uh, represented in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the total, uh, the, the mean annual incidence for congenital hydrocephalus is about 81 per 100,000 live births. And there's, there's a pretty significant variation among different countries such that high income countries may have 78 cases per 100,000, but low to middle income uh, countries, uh, that figure rises to about 106 to even 120 per 100,000 live births. Um, and then the, gro the global prevalence shows um, similar variation among different countries, such that the prevalence in North America is about 56 per 100,000 uh, know, patients. Uh, and then again, this is all for pediatric hydrocephalus. And the prevalence in Africa is almost double that, 104 per 100,000. So because there's no, you know, medical treatment for hydrocephalus and it's all surgical treatment that, that results in, in a really significant population of kids um, who are treated initially and then followed really for their lifetime. Some of the common etiologies of pediatric hydrocephalus include post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, myelomeningocele, congenital aqueductal stenosis, and then post-infectious hydrocephalus. Um, the, the reason for such the, the, the significant high number of cases in sub-Saharan Africa um, is, uh, you know, largely due to post-infectious hydrocephalus, which is the most common etiology of hydrocephalus uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. These are just some picture examples of post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and then myelomeningocele with a CRI2 malformation uh, and then uh, congenital aqueductal stenosis, uh, respectively. So uh, the, there are two main treatments of, of uh, hydrocephalus in the pediatric and the adult world. Um, the primary one, which everyone is very familiar with, is cerebral spinal fluid diversion via shunt insertion. The preliminary design was back in the 1950s. Um, the initial patent was in 1956 uh, and involved the Holter valve with a shunt and silastic tubing. Um, the sh you know shunts do a tremendous job of reducing mor mortality and neurological morbidity. Unfortunately, they've had essentially the same design since the 1950s and 1960s, with minor alterations, including additions of anti-siphon devices, et cetera. But in general, you know, shunt technology has remained relatively stagnant um, with non-programmable valves, programmable valves, et cetera. Um, because of some of the shortcomings of shunts, uh, a different Try, a, a different surgical treatment for hydrocephalus includes endoscopic ventriculostomy with or without choroid plexus cauterization. We generally consider choroid plexus cauterization in infants less than or equal to 12 months of age, and there are some studies who support it less than or equal to 12, 24 months of age. Um, this provides the ability of achieving cerebral spinal fluid diversion without shunts. Um, and there are some patients who are great candidates, and then some patients who unfortunately will have less than favorable outcomes um, using ETV, CPC. But still, the primary modality of uh, hydrocephalus treatment is with a shunt. <laughs> um, shunts are great. Like I said, they reduce mortality and reduce neurological morbidity. However, there are a lot of shortcomings. And as you know, everyone in the crowd is aware, um, shunt failure can reach up to as high as 40 to 50% within the first two years after insertion. 
rates of infection, uh, depending upon the study, uh, about four to 17% per procedure. Typically the highest risk is within the first six months. At HCRN centers, HCRN is a hydrocephalus clinical research network, um, which I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm our site PI. It's an organization which I am very, very passionate about. Um, it's about 14 centers in the United States and Canada whose primary commitment is to improve the diagnosis and treatment of pediatric hydrocephalus. Following a protocol that the HCRN developed, uh, HCRN centers have found a, a reduced infection risk of about 5 to 8.8%, depending upon uh, which study in which year. Um, but overall, the long-term sh long shunt failure is about 63 to 80% over 10 to 12 years following insertion. So that majority of patients who undergo shunt insertion during childhood will have at least one revision during their lifetime. Okay, and so that's that's one of the you know the major uh, shortcomings of a shunt is the potential for a malfunction or an infection. Um, one of the other, uh, you know, one of the problems that leads to revisions and one of the other problems that, um, that patients with shunts experience are cerebral, is, is cerebral spinal fluid over drainage. Um, radiographically, that can result in extra axial fluid collections and subdural hematomas. Um, clinically, it can result in a slit ventricle syndrome when the ventricles collapse, uh, especially over prolonged duration of time. Patients can experience low pressure headaches, which can be very difficult to diagnose in the infant and toddler population unless you really play detective work and figure out a pattern to their headaches um, when, when, you know, when parents kind of give you a description of, of uh, their, their, you know, their child's day. Um, and then uh, cosmetically, as well as more, you know, more from a morphometry perspective, uh, with over drainage during infancy, kids can develop microcephaly and cranial deformity. And that can be very distressing uh, for families and very distressing for care providers. It can be very challenging to treat. And at the really end of the spectrum uh, with over drainage, you know, during treatment of hydrocephalus in infancy and the toddler years is post shunting acquired craniosynostosis, which we're going to go into some more detail. So um, looking at some of the studies in the past, um, you know, from a, from a cerebral spinal fluid dynamics perspective, uh, multiple studies uh, quote the same figure of cerebral spinal fluid production it was about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 uh, milliliters per minute. Um, and that, and when you do the calculations, that results in about 450 to 550 uh, milliliters or cc's in a, in a 24 hour day. So the cerebral spinal fluid repopulates about three times uh, in a given day. And um, when looking at some of the uh, laboratory studies in, in, uh, in patients who, you know, in, in laboratory models for shunting and then clinical studies for shunting, um, there unfortunately um, is a pretty high uh, frequency and occurrence of cerebral spinal fluid shunt over drainage. And a lot of that is due to pressure pulsations despite sophisticated valve mechanics. Um, some of the reasons for over drainage include gravity dependence. So siphoning when a patient goes from the horizontal position to the vertical position. And then actually just physiologic rhythmic pulse pressures like in the cardiac cycle. And that can achieve pressures about two to 2.5 centimeters of water. So not that significant. However, Valsalva maneuvers, um, which augment pulse pressures can reach as high as 60 centimeters of water, um, which is well above the threshold for, for uh, pressure dependent shunt valves. So um, a, a group in University of Wisconsin led by uh, Berman Iskandar, uh, Benny Iskandar is one of the leaders in pediatric neurosurgery. He was uh, just the president of the AANSCNS section, uh, combined section on pediatric neurosurgery. Um, he's someone I've been talking to a lot over the past six to 12 months um, about you know, cerebral spinal fluid over drainage. Um, their group created a, uh, a benchtop model, which was a pseudoventricle benchtop valve testing platform. Um, that, that's just kind of a, um, kind of a, uh, uh, you know, like sort of a, a breakdown of their of their bench model, which included a pseudoventricle, um, a a, uh, a mechanism to create pulse pressure, a compliance chamber, a valve, and then a measurement of outflow. And they found that differential pressure valves at least mitigated cerebral spinal fluid increases. However, there were still uh, multiple uh, instances of, of higher than anticipated cerebral spinal fluid flow rates, which were observed under various conditions. So as we mentioned, you know, gravity dependent reasons like siphoning, there was an increase in cerebral spinal fluid outflow by two to four times, okay? And then the uh, 
during physiologic intracranial pulse pressure, uh, like pressure pulsations, such with cardiac cycles and, uh, and, and valsalva maneuvers. In the vertical orientation, there was about a 15 to 16 and a half cc per hour amount of drainage. In the horizontal orientation, uh, it was much less, about 0 0.3 to, to 5 cc's per hour, but still pretty significant and well above the threshold um, for uh, pressure dependent valves. Um, in some of the clinical studies that have looked at uh, reasons for shunt failure and shunt revision, um, the, the uh, adjunct of neuroendoscopy has helped significantly uh, in just surgical outcomes, but also actually in defining some of the reasons for failure. And uh, one study which looked at operative shunt revisions that were performed with neuroendoscopy found that 28% uh, of failures were over drainage related uh, ventricular uh, that, that involved over drainage related ventricular catheter ependymal bands. So basically, because of continued drainage, um, the ependymal walls would kind of get um, sort of suctioned into the uh, the orifices of the ventricular catheter and then create these ependymal bands within the catheter. Um, so their, their research group concluded that chronic cerebral spinal fluid over drainage uh, related ependymal bands represented a predominant factor in proximal catheter malfunction. Functions. So in addition to exposing patients to risks of shunt failure, supraspinal fluid overdrainage, particularly during the infant and toddler years, exposes patients to another risk. And this is one that I've, I've gotten, you know, uh, particularly interested in over the past six to eight months. Um, and that's post-shunting acquired craniosynostosis or PSAC. Um, uh, you know, craniosynostosis actually can, you know, obviously can occur from a variety of different reasons. It can be idiopathic, it can be syndromic, um, but this is an acquired and really an, you know, unfortunately an iatrogenic sequela. Um, so craniosynostosis involves um, early fusion of the cranial sutures. Post-shunting acquired craniosynostosis um, is, is particular in that it, it occurs following cerebral spinal fluid shunt insertion. As I mentioned before, it can be very challenging to manage for care providers and very distressing for families. It requires frequent surveillance and even possible craniofacial repair. Um, the, the prevalence varies widely in the published literature. Older estimates in the 1970s were about 1% to 5% uh, by a group, but that was, it was likely under-recognized. Um, it's challenging to diagnose this unless you get the appropriate imaging studies and have the appropriate clinical concerns. Newer estimates um, in a study that was performed by a plastic surgery team uh, over 2006 to 2012 showed that the rate of post-shunting acquired craniosynostosis in infants uh, who undergo treatment of hydrocephalus can reach as high as 49%, which is pretty staggering. Um, the mean age, in that study, the mean age at cerebral spinal fluid shunt insertion was about two, you know, 2.3 months, um, so really congenital hydrocephalus. And then the median duration of time to the diagnosis of post shunting acquired craniosynostosis, about 26 months. So it can even, you know, uh, up to over two years following insertion. So um, we were interested in our own groups uh, and, our, and our hospitals experience in, in, in you know, treating infant hydrocephalus. And we were, you know, we were curious about our own, our own uh, site's uh, prevalence of post-shunting acquired craniosynostosis. So we conducted a single site retrospective review. Uh, this was with one of our senior residents, uh, Dr. Lauren Schultz. She's a, she, you know, she's a star. And then Jeremy Jones, um, who's a neuroradiologist and just uh, truly a phenomenal neuroradiologist. So, we looked at the prevalence and characteristics of hydrocephalic infants developing post-shunting acquired craniosynostosis. Um, our inclusion criteria was particularly hydrocephalic infants undergoing uh, cerebral spinal fluid shunt insertion around age less than equal to 12 months uh, at, you know, at our hospital, Nationwide Children's Hospital. We started off small. We just looked at you know three years, 2020 to 2022. Um, we are extending that now, but uh, that was the initial study. And with at least six months of follow-up, the exclusion criteria, obviously, as you can, as you can predict um, or expect, um, any pre-existing craniosynostosis or craniofacial syndrome, um, those, were, those patients were obviously still excluded. So um, some of the data elements that we extracted are the frontal occipital horn ratio. Uh, the frontal occipital horn ratio is probably the most commonly used quantitative metric for hydrocephalus. The Evans index was used previously, but the frontal occipital horn ratio was shown to have the highest um, 
um, the highest uh, accuracy when comparing when comparing to uh, three-dimensional ventricular volume measurements. Uh, and that's uh, based upon a landmark paper by O'Hearn. So the frontal occipital horn ratio was used preoperatively and then postoperatively. And then we looked at um, serial head circumference percentiles, which, you know, going through uh, pediatric neurosurgery training, you understand and come to learn that head circumference measurements are kind of one of the, one of the more important, um, you know, data elements that we uh, evaluate when, uh, when looking at a patient's progress prior to treatment and then post treatment. So um, just for some descriptive statistics, we found a total of 64 subjects that fit our inclusion criteria. And we found a, a prevalence of post shantic acquired craniosynostosis synostosis of about 19%. Um, which is certainly well below the, the highest published rate that we found in the literature, 49%, well above some of the rates that were, you know, that were shown in the, in the 1970s, which were likely underestimates. In all honesty, the prevalence of 19% is probably an underestimate as well, just because not all of our patients undergo head computed tomography. We have a low dose head computed tomography, um, which is a modified protocol, just looking at cranial synostosis to try to reduce diagnostic radiation exposure in kids. But still, um, as long as, as unless there is a high clinical concern, a lot of these patients are not getting these scans. So 19% is probably an, an, an underestimate. Um, we, uh, we found that the diagnosis of post shunting acquired cranial synostosis was about a mean of 1.2 years F, uh, following surgery, um, but with a wide, you know, with a wide range, can be as early as a couple months, can be as late as three years following surgery. So, um, when we were uh, we were looking at uh, valve insertion, and we were wondering whether or not valve insertion could be a mitigating factor for kids developing post shunting acquired cranial synostosis, and we, we we found an interesting trend in that um, uh, the insertion of a programmable valve uh, at the primary shunt operation occurred about 35 percent, or about a third of the time, in patients who didn't develop post shunting acquired cranial synostosis, and about 50 percent in those who did develop post shunting acquired cranial synostosis, and then. Uh, similarly, mitigating interventions, meaning programmable valve adjustments or surgical revisions to place a programmable valve in a patient who previously had a non-programmable valve. There was also a, a you know, a, a, a stark contrast in that patients who didn't uh, who didn't develop post shunting acquired cranial synostosis were um, had about 17% mitigating interventions. Patients with post shunting acquired cranial synostosis had about 50% mitigating interventions. So. Um, you know, you could look at the data and say, well, is the programmable valve the problem? And I, I don't think that's it. I think there's a confounding factor. I think that going into surgery, surgical teams were sophisticated enough to realize that there was going to be a problem. And from the get-go, we tried we, we placed programmable valves anticipating that there might be a problem. However, despite our interventions, despite using the programmable nature of the valve to decrease the amount of cerebral spinal flow uh, diversion, and even mitigating interventions like repeat surgery to change to programmable valve, despite all these interventions, unfortunately, despite best efforts, kids still develop post shunting acquired cranial synostosis. So we believe that there are confounding factors. Um, about two thirds of the uh, patient cohort developed collapsed or slit ventricles prior to the diagnosis of post shunting acquired cranial synostosis. So there were some, you know, some red flags about uh, over drainage prior to the diagnosis. Additional st descriptive statistics: uh, cranial suture involvement um, was uh, often was basically more anterior in nature, so unilateral or bilateral coronal in three fourths of the patient cohort. And then uh, sagittal, about two thirds. Bilateral lambdoids, so look more posterior involvement, was was less frequent. And about fifty percent of the uh, uh, patients who developed post shunting acquired cranial synostosis developed multi suture cranial synostosis. This is important because multi suture cranial synostosis is is uh, a lot more complicated and challenging to treat than a single suture cranial synostosis, and has a higher risk of creating cranial deformity and leading to microcephaly. Um, fortunately, despite the high percentage of patients who develop multi suture cranial synostosis, only one out of the uh, 12 subjects, about 8%, required cranial vault reconstruction. Um, generally, surgery is considered for those individuals who develop craniocephalic disproportion, and, and that can be, you know, um, very, uh, you know, very symptomatic despite having a working shunt. So some of the comparative results for the cohorts of post shunting acquired cranial synostosis versus those who did not develop post shunting acquired cranial synostosis, the hydrocephalus etiologies were similar, and the mean age at um, cerebral spinal fluid shunt insertion were similar. Uh, again, these are occurring really at about you know three months of age for uh, you know congenital hydrocephalus. 
Um, and then, to, you know, to our surprise, uh, there wasn't a significant difference in terms of some of the radiographic indices that we were evaluating, specifically the frontal occipital horn ratio. So um, there was no difference in the preoperative or baseline frontal occipital horn ratio. And there was no difference, and this was probably the most surprising, there was no difference in the mean change in frontal occipital horn ratio between those developing post-shunting acquired cranial stenosis and those who did not develop post-shunting acquired cranial stenosis. So it's not necessarily that, you know, you know, we're, we're just shunting kids too aggressively, and those who develop post-shunting acquired cranial stenosis have an obvious, you know, um, significant reduction in terms of their ventricular indices. There's there's something else going on, um, given the fact that in comparison to the non, you know, non uh, the, the patients who didn't develop post-shunting acquired cranial stenosis, there was really no difference in, in radiographic indices. Um, the, one of the things uh, we found that was different was the mean change in head circumference percentile. So this is looking at the baseline. Uh, head circumference percentile pre-treatment to then tracking them out over the first 12 months of uh, uh, after surgery. And there was a significant uh, difference between the mean change in head circumference percentile. So again, there, there were some red flags that were noticeable leading up to the diagnosis of post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis. Um, However, this was, you know, we, we understand the study limitations. This was retrospective, single center, and in a limited time window um, from 2020 to 2022, which we are now extending uh, back to 2016. So, you know, because we've recognized and identified this problem, which, um, you know, full disclosure, I don't think this is, you know, one of the sexier problems in neurosurgery, right? This is not, you know, one of the big medulloblastoma research projects, but um, because pediatric hydrocephalus is such a significant problem in our country and in the world, and shunting is the primary modality of treat, you know, is the primary treatment for this. And so many of the, you know, uh, patients who develop hydrocephalus develop it during their infant years. Uh, I really think this is a significant problem. It's something I've become very passionate about because this is, you know, I'm not saying we are harming these patients, but, you know, we could be doing a lot better. You know, we need to improve our treatment of hydrocephalus because we are exposing infants to these cranial deformities, future surgeries, and the potential for a very distressing problem for families to deal with. So this is one of the reasons I've become very passionate about this. So in the past couple months, um, We've really, uh, you know, uh, uh, put the microscope on this, pro you know, on, on this phenomenon, and we've developed this into a QI project. So, at our hospital, we've developed this into a QI um, initiative. Um, so far, we've you know, we've delivered educational presentations about post-shunting acquired cranial stenosis. Uh, we are in the process of trying to systematize radiographic, qualitative, and quantitative measures related to cerebral spinal fluid overdrainage, particularly the prepontine cistern, which is a qualitative assessment looking at the um, relative patency or um, you know uh, uh, presence of cerebral spinal fluid signal in the prepontine cistern, and then looking at the mammalopontine distance, okay, which uh, which reduces in the setting of overdrainage. We've created an EPIC screening tool for all ne pediatric neurosurgery clinic visits for individuals who undergo cerebral spinal fluid shunt insertion during infant years until they're, uh, you know, until they've completed their toddler years. And then we're in the process of building an EPIC auto-generated alert and prompt that may warn care providers when there is a risk for cerebral spinal fluid overdrainage, and then eventual post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis. Um, our global goal is to reduce the percentage of infants with shunted hydrocephalus who develop post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis from our baseline level of 19% to less than or equal to 15%, which is you know, fairly modest, but that's a 20% 20, 20 relative reduction. Um, we are also in the process of preparing an intramural grant uh, proposal uh, to investigate the impact of cerebral spinal fluid shunting for infant onset hydrocephalus on cranial morphometry. Um, through this, we hope to better define the prevalence of post-shunting acquired cranial stenosis um, over a longer time period from 2016 onward. We're going to be evaluating craniometrics, you know, particularly uh, measurements that have been used in the craniofacial world and sphere, uh, as well as in the hydrocephalus world, and kind of combining and meshing the two and looking at those changes following shunt insertion during the infant years, uh, during the infant year, uh, and then looking at particularly risk factors for post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis. Because we found that the two cohorts, those who developed and those who didn't develop post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis, because there wasn't really a significant difference in the ventricular indices, we think that there are probably some underlying predisposing factors for, predis for uh, post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis that care providers can then um, you know, can then use in their planning for cerebral spinal fluid diversion. Ultimately, we hope to come up with a predictive model for cranial deformity or post-shuntic acquired cranial stenosis in infants who undergo shunt insertion um, throughout their, their toddler years. 
Um, then we're also going to be uh, preparing an extramural grant proposal, uh, which, which with a similar investigation as above, uh, but it, we're going to extend the data collection to multiple centers and we're going to leverage our role in the hydrocephalus clinical research network and probably look for a grant through like the hydrocephalus association to, um, you know, to, to achieve that. So um, in conclusion, cerebral spinal fluid shunts, um, they've done a fantastic job of reducing mortality and neurological morbidity. However, cerebral spinal fluid shunt insertion uh, for infant onset hydrocephalus exposes these young children to the risks of cerebral spinal fluid overdrainage, which can include microcephaly, cranial deformity, and I think at the at the extreme post-shuntic acquired cranial synostosis, which can either be single suture or multi-suture. And the prevalence of post-shuntic acquired cranial synostosis right now varies very widely in the published literature. You know, we showed earlier estimates of one to five percent, which were clearly underestimates, and then more recent estimates of about 49%, which um, I'm hopeful is an overestimate. Um, so, uh, as we've shown um, through our own single site data, this, this contributes to our understanding of cerebral spinal fluid over drainage and post shuntic acquired cranial synostosis. But really uh, it's the multi-site data that will help uncover risk factors and hopefully help develop a predictive model for cranial deformity and, and post shuntic acquired cranial synostosis. Um, these are some uh, some of the references, you know, for this presentation and uh, some of the work that we've done so far. Um, and then I really want to just, you know, say thank you uh, very emphatically and, and very graciously. Um, I have such a, you know, uh, tremendous amount of respect for Dr. Quinones uh, and, and for your entire group there. Um, and just, uh, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, and how much, you know, how much I appreciate this opportunity, how much gratitude I have. And I would uh, welcome you, Dr. Quinones, and really everybody visit, you know, visit our, our, our hospital in the Midwest, Nationwide Children's Hospital and, and our Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. So, um, and if any of the residents want to get in touch with me, um, any questions questions about hydrocephalus, pediatric epilepsy, craniofacial, et cetera, our program. If you're interested in going to pediatric neurosurgery, I would love to talk to you. Um, any questions in general, you know, always, always available. So. Well, thank you, Dr. Pindrick. And thank you for dedicating your morning. I know that after this, I, oh, I no, saw no. already JP, Dr. Navarro, already put in your schedule there for the rest of the morning. Um, maybe we can kick it off. And if it's okay with you, uh, we have a, an audience, a capture audience there in the room, but I'm gonna kick it off. You, you said something in a very humble way that is not as sexy as a major blastoma research endeavor, but I would argue that what you're doing and pinpointing the problems, limitations, and opportunities for this will have a much larger impact. You know, as much as we like the medulloblastomas or the glioblastomas, you know, I would say that the reality is that this problem with hydrocephalus is of uh, much, much wider public health relevance in the globe, you know, in the world, you know, that goes beyond our glioblastoma research, beyond our medulloblastoma research and things like that, because it really has a tremendous impact on patients around the world. So I was thinking, having said that, how do we scale up? I mean, a lot of the shunts that we have in the United States, the programmable shunts, the fancy shunts, they don't exist in other parts of the world. It's it's prohibitive. So um, where do you see the field going in regards to, you know, one, the diagnosis, two, the management beyond the United States, in the globe? Because I always think that it is important to begin to think about those potential limitations. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, Dr. Worf has done a lot of work um, at the Cure Hospital in Uganda developing, you know, ETV, endoscopic third ventriculostomy with choroid plexus cauterization, and really trying to expand the application and utilization of treatments of hydrocephalus that don't require shunt technology, where um, resources, you know, and, 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 you know, resources may be prohibitive. Um, so I, I think trying to utilize ETV CPC in areas of, uh, you know, uh, less access to care and maybe lower resources is one option. Unfortunately, um, as we've seen, you know, uh, ETV CPC uh, is not as effective in various etiologies of hydrocephalus, particularly post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. In those kids, um, you know, I until there's a better treatment, you know, for shunts, um, I, I think that um, you know, continuing to use programmable valves. Um, 
I don't know. I think it's a great question of how to, um, you know, expand, uh, you know, ex expand delivery of, of programmable valves to other, you know, to other countries. Um, I think it's going to take some uh, cooperation with industry and, you know, trying to um, convey the importance of uh, providing adequate treatments for hydrocephalus into, uh, you know, within underdeveloped countries. Um, but, uh, it's a, it's a great question. I, I don't know if I have a great answer of how, you know, of how to, um, you know, better, you know, better distribute technology and treatments of hydrocephalus to those individuals, um, you know, who, who are within, you know, underdeveloped areas. I, I think it's a great question, but I don't, I don't not, I'm not sure what the answer would be. So. And then just as, as a follow up in that question I'm monitoring right here, you know, the chat and or the uh, hands of people on the audience. But as a follow up, one of the challenges that you mentioned is as you put the shunt, you know, the forces, the elasticity of the brain begins to change, yeah. you know, and the skull, you know, normally as the brain grows, the skull continues to grow and those sutures don't close, all right? And I see that from you. I'll go to you that from you in a minute. So how do you envision using sensors, uh, implantables, modern technology, artificial intelligence to begin to modulate these forces in such a way that these programmable shunts begin to self-adjust or at least you give the physician, the surgeon, a sense, oh my gosh, the pressure is changing. If we don't change this, you know, we won't be able to expand those futures. Is there any work going on in that space? There is, there is. I mean, there are, there are current implantable sensors, ICP monitors, which can be used to, um, you know, to, to measure pressures in, in continuous fashion. Um, I think the one of the primary findings would be a um, a lack of pressure pulsations and probably an overall reduction in intracranial pressure continuously throughout the day, uh, and then uh, a lack of pulsations. You know the 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 model of cranial growth um, typically relies upon um, physiologic pulsations through the cardiac cycle um, to con you know to, to um, create this kind of constant outwardly directed force um, that allows for cranial growth. So as there are pulse pressures and pulsations um, that um, kind of, uh, you know, push out the, the brain, cerebral spinal fluid and the dura that at, you know, that acts as a catalyst and a, and a, you know, propagating force to allow for cranial growth. I think in, in, with placement of an, of an intracranial pressure monitor, even if it were, um, you know, not one of the newer technologies, just like a fiber optic one, um, but uh, particularly with one of the newer ones, which can be uh, implanted and have longer rates of uh, measurement, even, you know, uh, outside of the hospital. I think you would see like a, a significant uh, reduction in the intracranial pressure, which would probably be, you know, subphysiologic. And the biggest problem, I think it would uh, prevent the pulsations, which are required to continue outward growth of the skull. Um, I think in the, that, that would probably be most prominent in infants and toddlers. One of the challenging issues with infants and toddlers is uh, some of these intracranial pressure, these, these um, implantable intracranial pressure monitors would be in place in the, would be placed within the calvarium. Unfortunately, infants and toddlers, the calvarium is thin. Uh, and so it might be a little bit prominent, probably wouldn't necessarily be, it would probably already contact the dura, which I think would be okay. Um, but the, some of the intracranial pressure monitors are going to be used in the older population, uh, adolescents and teenagers. And those individuals where, you know, the, the risk is less for cranial deformity and acquired craniosynostosis, I think those individuals are more likely just going to have symptomatic presentations, excuse me, of low pressure headaches, um, which can still be debilitating and, you know, and still impact their, their life. Um, but I think, you know, the, the newer technology with, uh, you know, intracranial pressure monitors, uh, which are implantable, um, may help in, you know, may help with symptomatic over drainage and low pressure. In kids, um, I think we may just have to use, um, un until those become small enough and thin enough for implantation in infants and toddlers, we may just have to use um, some of our more standard, you know, uh, principles of uh, tracking and following, including head circumference, you know, a low dose head CT, uh, and then, you know, physical examination. 
Amazing. Dr. Miller, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Pendrick. Really uh, very uh, interesting presentation. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm an interventional neuroradiologist, and uh, I echo Dr. Well, first of all, just quickly, I echo Dr. Uh, Kinonis' uh, uh, thoughts that what you're doing here has wide wide application and as as a public health problem dwarfs a lot of the other things that we think are much more sexy and much more uh, much more impactful. And I think what you're doing is great. And 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 I think the the um, the idea that you you bring that the technology to 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 addressing this problem hasn't changed that much since the 50s begs for another look and begs for the kind of things that you're doing. Um, recently, th there there's been um, the development of uh, of some of an endovascular uh, shunt uh, system, uh, you know, placed transvenously uh, towards the CP angle. And um, I was wondering, with with children, obviously, I've done angiograms on children, and I've done malformations and other things in children. Uh, we don't have a pediatrics um, uh, hospital here at at the campus, so I haven't been doing that for a while. But where and what what level and what what uh, age of children do you start to look to be able to to work in the endovascular space uh, with these kids and 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 if if you're aware of that technology, as I'm sure you are, do you, do you what do you think of the uh, of the idea of uh, of approaching the CSF problem from that direction? Sure, I think it's a great question. Uh, on the pediatric side, we you know we're we're limited by uh, patient age and body weight. Um, we we mostly encounter the question of how early we can perform, uh, you know, uh, neuro, you know, like cerebrovascular approaches in kids who <clears throat> kids um, who have vein of Galen malformations. Um, so we 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 often wait for a threshold of ten kilograms of body weight. Um, however, in extenuating circumstances, when a patient is showing signs of you know cardio cardiopulmonary distress. We will, you know, we will um, perform, um, you know, endovascular diagnostic and even procedural interventions below, you know, below the body weight of 10 kilograms. But um, that's kind of our best comparison um, in clinical experience and the literature. So unfortunately, you know, 10 kilograms, you know, of, of body weight uh, is well beyond the body weight that typically most of these patients undergo shunt insertion. So um, I don't know how much of an impact neuroendovascular therapy could have um, for, you know, for, for pediatric patients, particularly infants. Um, but yeah, I, I, I am aware of some of those treatment modalities. Um, you know, I've seen them uh, written uh, more, I guess, less, you know, kind of posterior fossa or, or CP angle and, and more attempts for trying to, you know, uh, establish some connection to the superior sagittal sinus. I just think that with, with infants and toddlers, um, you know, the vasculature being so friable um, and the caliber of the vessels may be limiting. So I'm not entirely sure if, if that's the avenue um, that we could, you know, make them, you know, uh, you know, have the most significant contribution. Um, but we are always trying to keep our, you know, our minds open and think outside the box in terms of different treatments of hydrocephalus. Um, so I'd be interested to see, you know, how, how much that, you know, that, you know, idea uh, gains traction, you know, in the adult world. And if there can be some type of similar application in the pediatric world, that'd be great. Um, I just, you know, I know that 10, you know, the, the, the cutoff body weight that we typically use for kids for endovascular, um, for vein of Galen malformations can be limiting for the timing of kids who need shunt insertion uh, for congenital hydrocephalus, which is often two to three months. So. No, no, thank you. It answers lots of my questions. I, yeah, I agree. You know, you, you think of the, the, uh, the advantages of not having the external, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the subcutaneous reservoir, those kinds of things. And, you know, obviously nice things, but it seems to me that there would be significant limitations in the younger kids. And that's what uh, I appreciate your addressing my, my thoughts. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I think it was a great question. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Pindrick. So thank you also. I see the schedule. You're going to spend time with the residents and then you're going to be meeting with some of the consultants and then with the research fellows as well. And then I'll have a few minutes towards the end just to thank you once again. And the team is going to send you your plaque. We really appreciate it. We really thank you, Jonathan, for your tremendous expertise, your dedication, and uh, taking the time to be with us this morning at, uh, out of your business schedule, out of your own family as well.
We really oh, appreciate it. Thank you, know, you so it. much. Thank you so Good. much, honestly, for the opportunity. I, I cannot thank you enough. This has been, uh, it's, it's awesome. Wonderful. Excellent. All righty. So I think that the, uh, Juan Pablo, do we have a different link for that to Pindrick to join? Is that we send it to him already? Yes, yes sir. Beautiful. All righty. So we'll see you in those links Jonathan, in a thank few you. minutes. Yes. Alrighty. I just need two minutes. My chief called me, so yes. I just got to call him back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds great. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.